cupcakes in your belly right now. That's great. That's awesome. Thanks for supporting the youth today and being a part of that. And today is it's just a unique day for our church. And we mentioned this the last few weeks, um, how excited we are to have Dr. Matthew Sleet with us. And uh, we're not going to have worship today. There's not going to be all the normal elements that you've experienced, um, you know, each week in our traditional service and in our modern service. But it's a day of learning and a day of growth. And uh, we've shared that our world is absolutely searching in so many places for hope. And uh, we, as believers, know where true hope is found. And it's found in Christ and it's found in Christ alone. So I pray today that you just have an open mind, um, that you would grow with me as we listen uh, to Dr. Sleeth. I know there'll be a time for question and answers as well. So we're going to go for about an hour, about 10 till 11, and then we'll take a break and then we'll come back in for the second hour. And uh, you can check out his table and his books as well out in the atrium during that time. But let me pray uh, before, we, before we invite him up. Father, we praise your name today that your presence is in this space. And uh, our world is as beautiful as it is, is also very, very broken. And there are so many today that are running from you and struggling with, with mental illness and struggling with losing hope and struggling to even see tomorrow. And yet the church is perfectly positioned, is perfectly positioned to bring hope in Christ Jesus to everyone. You've told us to go into literally all the world. And this room alone and those watching online today, the places that you've given us influence and opportunity to speak life to people, may you encourage our hearts today to do just that, to have empathy, to have a listening ear, and to be ready uh, for the Spirit's nudging to either speak up or to serve or just to love somebody in their time of need. So God, we thank you for all that you're up to and for the one that's hurting in this space today. I pray that before they leave, um, there's an encouragement from your spirit directly to their heart. And so, God, we love you, and we thank you for Dr. Matthew Sleeth and for his ministry and his wife Nancy and his kids, and we pray that you would be in this space today. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, let's welcome to the stage Dr. Matthew Sleeth. Thank you. Uh, as Kendrick said there... There are books out there. Am I going to feed back? You've got me pretty, like the great and powerful eyes there. Um, there. There are books out there, and my uh, marketing technique is that you can take one or leave a donation, and I don't care. Um, and if you need more, and sometimes ministries like prison ministries, that sort of thing, need books they can't pay for, you just let us know. Uh, there's also a sign-up sheet out there. Uh, my, my wife and, uh, makes a, a newsletter once a month, and we sell all the contact information to insurance, you know. And, <clears throat> and uh, if, does anybody here have a child that's in missions? Raise your hand. No. Okay. Um, uh, some of you may bump into my, my, the younger Dr. Sleep. My, my son is the medical director for all the Christian Missionary Alliance field workers. And uh, so some of you uh, might meet him in that capacity. He's the right one to ask the medical questions of. <laughs> uh, so I've come to talk about what is uh, just a heart-wrenching topic. And one, frankly, that uh, most of us want to avoid, and maybe I want to avoid it sometimes, but that's uh, people taking their own life as the ultimate endpoint of men mental illness or, or spiritual despair. And <clears throat> anybody here make it to revival down at Asbury? Raise hands. Oh, you guys ought to get out more. <laughs> um, uh, I, I also um, have been involved a little bit with that revival. So if people during question and answer time want to ask questions about that, I'll answer what I can. I'm going to try to split this so that I talk for no more than half the time and then you ask questions. And if you don't ask questions, it'll get really awkward in here after a few minutes. But, but my wife is a 
expert teacher, and I've seen her do this, and she just waits till the awkwardness overwhelms people, and then they start asking questions. So let's start about uh, just talking about the prevalence of uh, suicide and that sort of thing. But before I get started on that, I'll tell you the perspectives that I'm coming at this with. Uh, I speak, uh, first of all, as, as a man uh, who's been married for 42 years. To, uh, Nancy and I met when uh, she was 18. And uh, unlike a lot of people that are in church, not, not all of them, but um, we spent most of our life not as Christians. Uh, I, I met the Lord, I'll try to make this part very briefly. Uh, my wife is from a Jewish family. We raised our kids as little pagans. And uh, a bunch of things went wrong in our life. I was uh, uh, an ER doctor, and uh, I, I'm not sure whether it, it, exactly that time I was the ER director and its chief of staff. I think that came just a little later. And uh, a lot of things started going wrong in our life. And the first thing was that my wife's brother drowned in front of my children and her. And uh, just a series of other things not worth going into. But in, in, in a kind of a very dark period of our lives, uh, when I'm not sure the rest of the world thought, thought it was dark, and we don't know what's going on behind closed doors, uh, because I think we're very good at hiding that. Uh, I uh, started looking for truth. And uh, I, I had always thought that if you could measure it and reproduce it, uh, that was reality. And so when people talked about God, since I couldn't measure or reproduce it, I didn't think that was real. Uh, but in this dark period of life, I woke up to the fact that there was evil on the planet. Evil is a spiritual concept. You can't measure it, and hopefully you don't want to reproduce it. And so if evil is good, I reason there must be a source of good somewhere. And, and you see good in the emergency department, and what particularly would bring that to mind to me is those times when I'd be running a trauma code, and particularly if I was running a trauma code on somebody that we didn't know the name of. And you know, you can be in your car and your wallet doesn't show up with you, or, or you can be out jogging and you get hit, and you don't have an ID, and those people in the hospital are always registered as John or Jane Doe or Baby Doe, so you can get the computer system working and get lab work and that sort of thing on them. And I would sometimes just marvel, step back, running a code, that there would be 10, 15 people, you know, just in front of me and maybe dozens more in the hospital, working to save someone's life that we didn't even know the name of. Would you agree with me that that's good? <laughs> Yeah, um, and so I went looking for the source of good, and I read the Ramayana and the Bhagavad Gita and the Quran and a bunch of other books, and I found you know some interesting things there, but I didn't find out really where does the good come from on the planet that would motivate people to build a system where they would try to save someone's life without a name, uh, sometimes that, and it doesn't matter who that person was. Um, they didn't have to be famous or wealthy or anything like that. And uh, one, one morning in the emergency department, uh, ought, by the way, if you're going to have a heart attack, do it Sunday morning. Write this down. Between about the hours of 5 and 9 or 10, that's like the best time to get seen in an emergency department. And the department where I was in was real slow at that moment, and I wanted something to read. And I went out into the waiting room, and on a coffee table with a bunch of old magazines and everything, I found this orange book. And I picked it up and it said, Holy Bible on it. And I, I thought that I had never read this before. No way you're going to get that finished before the next patient comes up. So I stole it. <laughs> and the next thing that happens is what's called prevenient grace. And uh, John Wesley talked about it, but Jesus talks about it in Luke chapter 4. And... Uh, the prevenient grace is when God does something in your life before you even know that God exists, uh, and it's something beautiful. And here's the prevenient grace. A Bible is a big book. Where do you start reading in it? If my parents had named me Numbers, we wouldn't be here today. But they named me Matthew, and that's where I started, <laughs> prevenient grace. And I met Christ. I met Christ through Scripture. And by the time I got to about Matthew 7, I was hooked. And that changed my life, 
and it changed my son's life next. My son uh, gave that Bible to, and he read it, um, and he uh, was in high school, just starting high school, and he had a vision of uh, taking care of children, uh, and, he, and he had a medical bag, and he, and he figured it was Africa. So it's not surprising that uh, fast forward uh, almost a couple of decades, he's uh, director of pediatrics at Tinwick Hospital in Kenya. Uh, and that's a big admissions hospital. He has about an 80-bed NICU, residents, all that sort of thing. And uh, then, then my uh, wife uh, simply met Jesus walking down a mountain. She has not a mystic bone in her body, and she said, Christ was there, said he'd never leave her, and she's never doubted since. And my daughter had a, another lovely experience. So we're all on the same page <clears throat> as far as faith goes. And uh, so um, I come to you from the perspective of a Christian who was a pagan for the first 46 years of his life. And I also come with the a, with a training of a, a, a physician who believed in Hippocratic medicine even as a non-Christian. And a couple friends and I took the Hippocratic Oath. None of us were Christians. Uh, and they don't give the Hippocratic Oath uh, in general, uh, in any medical schools that I know of anymore. And in that oath, you swear that you'll never take advantage of a patient, that you will never help a patient kill themselves or anyone else kill a patient, and you will not do an abortion. And, and that ethic preceded my Christianity. And it preceded Christianity, Hippocrates did by about 500 years. And so I rolled into Christianity with some, some good ethics uh, behind me, but then had a reason behind why all those things uh, exist. So I was very fortunate uh, in that sense. So I come with the worldview that it is wrong to kill somebody. Uh, and not every physician has that worldview anymore. Uh, so I come with that worldview, I come uh, with the worldview of a Christian, and I come with the worldview of a, of a father and a grandfather. So how about suicide? <clears throat> suicide is, is very, very bad these days and very prevalent. Uh, the Center for Disease Control just released some statistics a couple of weeks ago that have really made some waves. and. Uh, uh, one of those is that about one-third of young women, that's like 25 and younger, uh, in this country wake up every single day struggling with whether or not to take their own lives. And um, in, the, in the coming year, 10 million Americans are going to wrestle with whether or not to take their own lives. And one and a half million of them will end up in an emergency department. Uh, being seen for that, and uh, <clears throat> and the good news is that m medicine can save virtually uh, at least three quarters, uh, probably more. I actually haven't cranked the numbers on that. Of of the folks who attempt suicide are saved. Twenty percent of those who actually jump or use firearms can be saved. Uh, and at the beginning of hope, always. I tell about uh, a young man who shot himself in the head, but um, uh, was able to live uh, through that. And so uh, the vast majority of people who attempt to take their own lives are saved, thank God. Uh, but we live in a kind of a sea of desperation right now. And and over the last 20 years, it's gotten worse by about 2% every year. And the secular world, if you will, if you ask them what we should do to make this situation better, they will tell you, do more of what we've been doing for the last 20 years. Does anybody know what it's called when you keep doing the same thing, expecting a new result? Insanity, yeah. And that's, that's kind of what we're facing on a lot of issues in society right now. Do more of what has made it bad, and that's insanity. And uh, uh, I think just a lot of people, particularly Gen Z, um, live in this milieu of de desperation, despair, anxiety, and we just put them through a, an epidemic, a pandemic, 
<clears throat> we put them in solitary confinement for a couple of years. And my heart just goes out to Gen Z. And have you heard about the Asbury Revival? At least tell me, you, yes, okay. It was gigantic. <laughs> just just an absolute outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Um, people ask me, it's real. I, I'm almost struggle to answer that. It's the most solid, real outpouring of Christ I've seen in 20 years of being a Christian. And uh, how many of you knew the district superintendent, uh, Ed Mangum, when he was DS here? Some of you knew that. So Ed's parents, Big Ed and Sharon, were on the front line for almost the entire time of uh, the revival at Asbury. Um, they actually both got COVID doing that, could care less. What they cared about was being able to pray for so many men and women. And yesterday I called Sharon, said, Sharon, you prayed with hundreds and hundreds of these young women. Uh, tell me how many of them were struggling with depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts. And she said, 80%. So uh, we know not only from data and everything, I know from human beings who have been praying with uh, uh, others that this is just so common in our, in our society right now. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> the question is, what does the Bible say about this? Because I turn to scripture for the answer for anything. And when we do question and answer, you can tell me where, you can ask me where plate tectonics are in the Bible, where the transitive qualities of math are in the Bible, you name it. I love to go anywhere in scripture. I believe this book has all the answers. <laughs> okay, that's the, that's the worldview I'm coming from. And so opening up scripture, <clears throat> first of all, do we as, as believers have a responsibility for these folks? And I'm just going to go to um, uh, Proverbs 24, verse 11. Rescue those who are being taken away to death. Hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, behold, we did not know this. Does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who keeps watch over your soul know it? And will he not repay man according to his work? There is, like most things in the Bible, there's both an implied bad side to that and an implied good side. The bad side is if you say, I don't care about the third of American young women who want to take their lives, God's going to recognize that. Um, and I don't think he's going to pat you on the back for it. But there's also an implied promise and a, and a reward, if you will, that if we as the church wake up to this and we want to care for these people, just as at Asbury, I just saw the spirit pouring out and healing and healing and healing, um, that God will, uh, will make his face to shine on us if, if we do that. Um, so... If you look in scripture um, further, and, and it's, it's never good to just snatch one line out of the Bible and build a whole theology or argument out of it, but if, if we look from one end to the other in scripture, we find that we have the answers here. And one of the amazing things to me is that the Bible has the answer to where does suicide come from. By the way, humans, we're, we're we're part of the animal kingdom. You know, we have the same physiology as many other animals and everything. Um, we sleep like they do, etc. But we have a soul. And the secular world does not acknowledge that we have a soul. Uh, but I do as a physician. And scripture talks about where suicide comes from. And you got to go as far as the first page of the Bible. And in that uh, beginning of humanity, you see... God made Adam and Eve in, in his image and breathed life into them, his life, and, and told them to do, to take care of this paradise that he put them in, and there was only one thing they were not supposed to do. And by the way, I believe Adam and Eve were the worst house guests in all of history. Number one rule when you're visiting, eat what's on your plate. And, and they didn't do that. Um, the other, you know, the other rule is answer the doorbell when God goes, you who, they ran. <laughs> uh, 
Um, don't stand somebody up. It goes on and on. You could do this. But Adam and Eve uh, were instructed by God that if you did this one thing in that day, you would surely die. And if you listen to somebody who views Scripture through the eyes of a scoffer, they'll say, well, Adam didn't really know or Eve didn't really know or um, how are they supposed to know what death was? They hadn't seen it yet. They were instructed by God. Do you think God didn't know that they knew <laughs> what would happen? It's God doing the teaching. And God said, you will commit suicide if you do this. And they went and did that thing, and they did not do it all by themselves. Who said it would be okay? They'd be better off. Satan, yes. I'm in a church that can call out the bad guys. Uh, thank you, Jesus. Um, and so uh, Satan said, you'll be better off. And if you follow Satan through Scripture, virtually every time sh Satan shows up, he's trying to get somebody to take their own life. And, and he shows up to Job and, and curse God and die is the poetry of Job for commit suicide. Uh, if everybody who used God's name in a swear today were to drop dead, you and I would not have a line when we get to Chick-fil-A at lunchtime. It just, phew, right through. Um, and so Job is... is, is is in this battle with Satan who's trying to get him to take his own life. And if you just fast forward all the way to the, to the New Testament, and right at the beginning of that, we see Christ and Satan having a showdown. Uh, and, and one of the three tricks that, that Satan uses on Christ is to try to get him to jump off a building to kill himself and see if he won't be better off. When Satan uh, enters into Judas, Judas betrays the Lord and then kills himself. Are you getting the pattern here? John, can anybody quote John 10.10 10 out loud by memory? Yeah, big, use your big outside voice, go ahead. I came that you'd have life. Satan came to lie and steal life and kill. And that's what he's doing at like crazy in society today. He's, he's making people lie and kill each other and kill themselves. And so scripture tells the story of a struggle that's gone on since the garden of good versus evil, of life versus death, of God versus Satan, and you and I are, are in the middle of this battle. And there's only one way we can win. We need an ally stronger than us. The Bible says this, we need Christ. So <clears throat> uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna tackle one question that comes up quite a bit before it's asked. And I'm just going to go to the heart of the hard stuff here. And that is, what happens if somebody kills themselves? What happens to their soul? Is suicide ultimately wrong? Is suicide a sin? By the way, I wrote an editorial a uh, few years ago about this uh, for the op-ed uh, page of the Lexington Herald-Leader, which is the town newspaper where I live. <coughs> Excuse me. And... Uh, at, in the end of this editorial, I said that maybe it's time that we rethink how we're treating suicide. Maybe we could even introduce the idea that this is morally wrong. And they wouldn't allow that line in. So I'm not allowed to have even an opinion in the secular world that suicide is wrong. But the Bible ex explicitly says that killing someone else or yourself is wrong. Your body is the temple of the Lord. Whoever destroys that, God will destroy them. Uh, thou shalt not kill thyself, in parentheses, anybody else um, there. And so we know that it's wrong. We know that it's a moral wrong. But still, what happens if somebody kills themselves and they were a Christian? What's the scenario there? And for that, I, I turn to the end of chapter 8 of Romans. Paul says, 
For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor heights nor depths nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's nothing that I did or will do that will separate me from Christ because his blood on the cross is the get out of jail free card <laughs> that I accept. Is anybody, are you with me theologically there? Okay. Um, but this says, I've got to be in Christ Jesus. And so I think there are people, and I've seen them and I've treated them, who have no idea what up or down, right or wrong is. And I think if they put their t- trust in Christ, that they um, will be in heaven with me and with Christ. Um, by the way, if you get to heaven and I'm not there, and some of you might get there sooner than me, and some are going to get there a lot late, later. My full name is John Matthew Sleeth. Go ask. Because it's been, caused a lot of confusion in this lifetime. Anyways. Um, <clears throat> so I, I believe that, that Christ's death on the cross covers me if I killed myself. I believe it's utterly against his will that I would kill myself. Just as it's against his will that I wouldn't be kind to somebody that I just met. Um, uh, so we have to depend every day on the grace of God as we move forward. Um, and then the question is, what, what has the church done about this? And I won't put you on the spot because you're a church out at the front of this. It has been a real struggle for me to bring this message to the church. Churches don't want to hear it. I spoke at a very, very, very large church to the pastors there, and there were 80 pastors on staff. And I spoke about suicide to them, and I taught uh, for a number of hours. And at the end, I said, why don't, why don't you just have me to church to talk about this? And I was told that they had made a strategic decision never to use the word suicide from the pulpit. <clears throat> they changed their mind after two of the pastor's kids killed themselves in the next month or so. But it has been a very difficult message to bring to the church. I think that one of the reasons is that we instinctively know it's wrong, but um, the Generation Z coming along doesn't have the same instinct. They weren't raised in a Christian culture. And so a lot of things we take for granted uh, we can't take for granted anymore. Are any of you in healthcare? Raise your hands. Okay. Um, one of I'll give you an example of where a Christian culture can influence things. My son, medical director for the Christian Missionary Alliance, is in Kenya, and one of the most frustrating things to him, and I think you can understand this, is that they operate under a different ethic, and so. One thing that happens, uh, has happened on a number of times in the six years that he's been there, is that a woman will arrive at the hospital uh, in labor, but dead. And the reason is that she was at another hospital and they decide to shut down for holiday or shut down to go on strike. And so they just dump those people out. If they're wealthy enough, they can get transported to another hospital but they die in labor on the way and the children die. In the United States, how long do you think it would take Morgan and Morgan and everybody else that's got a big sign to be suing you if you dumped a a woman in labor out on the street? Bang, like that. The reason that American and Western doctors will never desert their patients a nurse will never desert a patient, an ambulance attendant won't desert their patient, is because we still run on a Christian ethic. And in the Bible, that ethic is established because who never deserts Paul? His doctor. (laughs) Um, And the, and the the largest single chunk of the New Testament is written by a physician, and there's reasons for that. So when we, when we just kind of live in this culture, we can make the right decisions without even knowing why we did it. We no longer live in that culture. 
And so Gen Z is coming along and they don't know if it's right or wrong. And they haven't been told. And we're going to have to actually start teaching these things uh, in church. Because has anybody ever seen this yard sign that says love is love? It's like saying a chair is a chair. <laughs> what it's really saying is anything you decide is love is love. Well, the Bible says God is love. But this is the manual of how you do it. <laughs> and I uh, sometimes if I'm better prepared than I am today, I'll, I'll pull out a letter that I have from two brothers in Texas who describe why they're going to kill all five of their family members, and it's because they love them so much that when they, their suicide pact is complete and they're dead, they said, we didn't want to upset our family, and we knew it would upset them, so we killed them. Love is not what you decide it is. Love is what God decides it is. Um, so I, I think we have to start, um, oh, and I've gone just past the halfway point here. So we're getting to the awkward silence time, and all guys' eyes go to Kendrick first, okay? Because if he doesn't come up with a good question, um, come raise time. <clears throat> On the other hand, if he comes up with a truly spectacular question, you got to double his salary. <clears throat> so I'm going to let you ask any question you want about this or anything out of scripture or science or medicine or art or whatever you want, um, as long as it's nice. I don't answer snarky questions. Did I give you enough of a heads up? Do you have your first question? Uh, Matt, I'm still thinking of <laughs> 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 Yes, go ahead. Uh, I believe that if a, someone put their trust in Christ uh, and, and that he never leaves a sheep behind, it, nonetheless, it's wrong. I believe that if I stole a pack of mints out of the green room, which I think I did, <laughs> then I'm covered, even though it says thou shalt not steal. But I knew your brothers and sisters, that's not even stealing because you'd want me to have it, Right. Because my breath would smell bad. If it, uh, anyways, so it, it, uh, all sin is covered by Christ's death on the cross. And as Paul said, on this side of the cross, we can do anything we want, but not everything is good for us. And so it's wrong. Let's establish that. But Christ's atonement is so powerful that if you put your trust in Christ, you're covered. Is that more explicit? I'm, I'm sorry if I did not state that clearly. Yes. They will not go to heaven. The Bible says they will, yeah, they will be in hell, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> One of the most powerful things that um, I ever heard of the argument of why we should always be presenting the gospel, we should always be offering salvation through Christ, is by one of the world's great atheists. There's a magic team called Penn and Teller, and I think Penn is the one that talks and Teller never says a word. They're brilliant. Um, they made a movie called uh, uh, Tim's Vermeer. It's just incredible. Uh, it's a documentary on a Vermeer painting. But, um, but Penn goes out and argues why God doesn't exist. But he says that he never gets upset by somebody coming up and once again trying to offer him uh, the gospel. And he says, listen, if you really believe that hell is true, and if you really believe you had the key to keep somebody out of it, what kind of human being wouldn't come up and try to convert him? And so it, it, it's, it's just as incumbent upon us uh, to, to offer physical life and it's even more incumbent upon us to offer uh, somebody the hope of eternal life because that comes through Christ. So great questions. Kendrick, your crew is showing you up here. Yes. Que the question is, why is there an increase in suicide among veterans. 
and there has been a dramatic increase. Um, I was on the phone with the guy in the Pentagon uh, when I was writing Hope Always, who's in charge of making sure people don't kill themselves. And I won't use his name because he says, you're seeing the statistics of the enlisted. He says, we're not even releasing the officers. He said the ranks are being decimated uh, by this. And I think uh, the, the, at, the, at the root cause of, of suicide, it's a spiritual illness. Uh, I, belie I believe you should treat things medically when you can. Uh, Asa the king had bad feet, and he just went to the doctors. He didn't pray. We're supposed to pray and seek you know, medical care. Call the elders to anoint. Oil is the medicine uh, for, for illness. When the Good Samaritan is putting oil on the wounds of, of this Hebrew that he's only partially related to, he's treating them medically. So I believe in both the medical treatment and, and the spiritual treatment. And what was the question? Wow, I wandered down the... Oh, why, why more vets? Um, uh, I, and I also work with a group called Reboot Recovery. And I went around the country on a tour talking with them. And that, that, that uh, effort started with just treating vets. And, and there's something called a moral injury <laughs> that can happen to people. I think more and more of our soldiers and, and those around them um, don't know why they're there, are not reinforced <laughs> for what they're doing, and um, are just disconnected from morality. Uh, I, I, and so, uh, you know, it just kind of accelerates the things that uh, a genera or th those that are at home and everything are experiencing. In church, by the way, we, we, we give plenty of content, but I think the real great stuff happens over there eating pancakes, and I'm serious, that we have connection. So there's no shortage of content. You can Google something and get, you know, a million literally answers to something, but, but that we're feeling more and more disconnected. And that's particularly true if you are taken from home in a foreign place, moved around, et cetera, et cetera. I, I think that's part of what's going on. And, uh, and the chaplains have their hands tied these days. My, my son uh, went to University of Kentucky um, uh, for med school. He did his residency there. He is a fearless Christian, <laughs> utterly fearless. Um, and the only time that he's gotten in trouble for praying with a patient, the chaplain wrote him up. It's true. <laughs> And so there are still chaplains in the military who believe in God, but there's a lot of them there just punching the clock. And so they don't have access sometimes to people who can give the truth. Sometimes you got to say, get on your knees and pray to Jesus. You can't say, well, talk to the great spirit. And it, um, so I think that's, they're separated from the people who can actually give them the answers. So, boy, these are great questions. You than you. Kendrick, man, you better get ready to go. Okay. <laughs> it seems like you hear and read more and more about, unfortunately, how many young generations are considering killing themselves in high school, 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 and in elementary school. And what concerns me is that a lot of children haven't received the Lord because their parents haven't pushed them out. And uh, I'm going to restate that so everybody hears it. I believe that your question is, what's the bottom, bottom line of why so many young people are killing themselves? And you mentioned a lot of them don't know anything about God. And uh, I think you answered your own question. <laughs> they don't know anything about God. And uh, it's, you know, truth is what sets us free. And I'm going to go at another area here. Um, by the way, in the next stay for the next service, if you want, and we'll just keep answering questions. I was telling Kendrick that I was just down at Tacoa Falls uh, College. Anybody know that? 
Oh, some people have gone as far south as Georgia. All right. Um, and I, was, I gave chapel on Tuesday and Wednesday. And Tuesday, I, I said, I've only, I was asked to talk about suicide. I said, I've only got 30 minutes. 30 minutes is not enough time for me to save your life. It's just not enough. And I said, so if you want to stay afterwards, they gave me the chapel for a few hours. I talked for three hours answering questions about 200 students. My impression of Gen Z is that they will stay as long as my voice lasts if I'm talking truth. And that's whether or not they're Christians or whatever. I've done this at UC Santa Barbara, Western Washington University, Dartmouth, on and on. It doesn't matter whether I'm in a Christian school or not. Gen Z will sit there and listen to truth. And that, I believe, is why this giant revival awakening, and it's giant because it's moving across the country. It's not just people praying in churches or chapels, and that's all great. It's people at work realizing, what do I do for Jesus today? And, and, uh, and, and one of, it's very interesting. The, uh, the, the, the word or, or the impression, it's not just an impression, the reality of these tens of thousands of young people that came to Wilmore, Kentucky, the holy city. Has anybody been to Wilmore? End of the earth. <laughs> no Starbucks. Almost like Nazareth was, uh, according to, to Nathaniel. <clears throat> Hold on. Can I go down a bunny trail for a second? Will you get me back on? Bartholomew says, what good comes from Nazareth, right? And walks over, meets Jesus and everything, and Jesus says, a true son of Israel in whom no Jacob is left. <laughs> and he gets it. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I believe that Jesus just had this ear-to-ear -ear grin because here's a guy without guile who's praying under a fig tree, very important symbol in the Bible, and um, Jesus, they will call him a Nazarene. Anybody ever read that in Scripture? He will be called a Nazarene. You went to school. You're on the spot now. It says that, right? It does say that. Chapter and verse. No. Um, <laughs> and the word Nazarene doesn't show up in the Old Testament. It does. And Nathaniel forgot. He grew up before us like a little tree out of dry ground. Little tree out of dry ground is Nazarene, Nazareth. So, whew, even though this is, guy has no guile in him, even though he's there praying for the Messiah, I'm positive he forgot to connect the dots. We all do. <laughs> Heads up, folks. We're human. Um, okay, what was the next? Who's got the next question? Yes, sir. The question is, untreated addiction, does it end up in insanity or death? Yes. Um, addiction, by the way, I'm going to go down another Bible bunny trail. Do you mind? People love this most places who know the Bible because they get to learn more about the Bible. I believe um, that uh, Judas was probably an alcoholic. Why do I believe that? Well, because of a painting. Has anybody ever, like Paul was on the road to Damascus and he fell off his horse? You heard that? It comes from a painting by Caravaggio. It's beautiful. And, and Paul's on his back and this great war horse is trying not to step on him. War horses are trained not to step on, on the person that was on them. It's a, it's a handy thing to do. Um, and, and so a lot of people say, oh, Paul fell off his horse. He just falls to the ground. It's not off his horse. But Caravaggio really saw into the Bible. And um, there's a painting that he did, the taking of Christ in the garden. And he's coming up to kiss Christ to tell the soldiers who to take away. And his eyes are bloodshot and his cheeks are all red. What did he steal the money for? He can't go buy new tennis shoes. <laughs> They're going to see that, right? There's nothing he can spend the money on, I think, other than pounding down more 
booze. Um, I don't know that for certain, but I do know that untreated addiction, just like you said, ends in death or despair or suicide. One of the things in the book, Hope Always, that I talk about is, I call it the life continuum scale, not available in stores or any other book. Um, And I talk about how if you walked into a psychiatrist's office and you wore your seatbelt and you're well-dressed and you have a job and you're thinking about vacation this summer and where are you going to be five years from now, the psychiatrist would say, there's nothing I can do with you. You're, you're fine. You don't have, you're not thinking about suicide or whatever. Now I'll step over into Christianity. And Jesus said, now let's get started working. <laughs> and, and so we have a different idea of what normal is versus the rest of the world and what holy is versus the rest of the world. At one end of the scale, we're willing to die, give our lives for somebody else. And at the other end of the scale, people aren't just killing themselves anymore. They're taking the rest of the plane with them. They're taking the rest of the family. Have you noticed how there's more murder suicides now? And that's where it's going to keep going. And it all gets down to a spiritual thing. And at the heart, addiction is a spiritual illness. And uh, uh, for those who are in uh, 12-step programs, uh, you know, it starts with saying there's something bigger than me in the, in the world. I wish they would name the bigger thing, but they don't. So good questions. Kendrick, what's your question? Whatever their question is. Uh, a- yeah. How do you read the Bible? Yeah, very good answer. All right, yeah. Balcony, Yes. What about children wanting to commit suicide? Uh, in, my, in my city of Lexington, we had in a, a month's time a 9, a 10, 11, a 12, and a 13-year-old all take their own life. Um, there are five-year-olds taking their own life now. Listen, when I, I saw um, Peter Pan, I remember very clearly seeing that movie, Any, anybody as old as me, I went down in the basement to see if I could fly. They live in a world where they're not nailed down to reality. And every single little girl has it pounded down their throat. You can be anything you want to be. Is it any surprise they want to be dead? Is it any surprise they want to be a guy? Is it any surprise any of this? They're told non-truths practically from the time they're born. And, And that's just reality. And the end of that is despair. And I I wanna get into something that Jesus talks about because if you ask somebody who's depressed, who's contemplating suicide, they, by the way, if I'm in a a room with a bunch of psychiatrists and secular people, and I I start talking about Satan, woo, you ought to see the hair come up on the back of their neck. And I gotta calm them down by reminding them that a majority of the suicide notes have, whether the people believe in God or not, the line, I can no longer deal with the demons. Over and over and over again, that shows up in suicide uh, notes. So this is a spiritual illness. There is no animal on this planet that commits suicide. One of the problems with studying suicide is conscious postulates and things like that. You can't come up with with a model for it. There's never been a zebra that woke up one morning in all of history and said, to heck with it, I'm not running for Mr. Lion today. This is a human, it's a soul illness and everything. And Jesus, uh, and if you ask somebody, they're suicidal, they'll, they'll say, I can't deal with the pain anymore. And if you ask them where they hurt, is it their head, is it their arm, is it their stomach? Eventually, they will say, no, it's my soul whether they believe in God or not. And Jesus says, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am humble and meek, and you will find rest for your soul. And that's one of the reasons I preach about Sabbath so much. Rest for your soul is getting harder and harder to find. And one of the keys for finding that Jesus says, I'm humble and meek, and everything in the world today tells you to be powerful 
have an, be an influencer. You've got 16-year-old influencers with millions of you, what are they, thumbs up or followers or whatever they are, who are killing themselves. That's not where you find rest for your soul. We have pastors. I, I've been, I'm sorry, I've been to mega churches where all the pastor talks about is how many, what, what shirts and shoes you should wear. I've, I preached at the National Cathedral 12 times. Nobody told me what to wear. It's only when I've gone to churches over 10,000 that I'm told what to wear. Be like me is, is what the pastor is saying. I am powerful. Um, you can't get to me even in a lot of these churches. And so even in religion, we're pushing the exact opposite of Jesus who was so humble and so great at hospitality. By the way, to me, the most disturbing thing that's happened, I'm going to go down a negative trail here. You get me back on the positive one. But the most negative thing that's, that's happened in, in faith over the last 50 years is the utter lack of hospitality. We, we started having, because the Bible says you have to be hospitable. We started having dinner at our house every Friday night almost 20 years ago. We've had thousands of people through hundreds of pastors. And my wife and I, since we're starting to write about hospitality, we've been invited into a pastor's home for dinner less than 10 times in 20 years. And, and so the church needs to re-engage with how do we do hospitality? How do we offer forgiveness? Um, uh, things like that that we've just walked away from. And how do we present the end point of being a Christian, not in being a mega pastor, you know, blown up on a 50-foot screen, but offering hospitality at the most inconvenient time. By the way, I cannot think of a less convenient time to offer hospitality than the night before you're going to be tortured and put to death. And Jesus takes off his robe and he washes his disciples' feet, including the person who's going to betray him. And so we live in a, a world that just pumps. You must be famous. You must be influential. You must be wealthy, on and on and on. And the only rest we're going to find for our soul is by being humble and meek. <laughs> and there isn't another formula to it. And that's one of the reasons I'm so big on Sabbath, because if you do Sabbath right, You'll just find rest for your soul. As a matter of fact, in the next hour, I should stop now. In the next hour, I'll actually lean into more of the what we should do right. Than, and, and Jesus really said, listen, you've got weeds and you've got wheat or flowers, the good stuff. And we spend so much time worrying about the weeds. And Jesus says, water the flowers. So in, in the next hour, I'm going to lean into water and the flowers, if that's okay. And someday Jesus will just come with Roundup and it'll all be great. Okay, so Kendrick, you, you, you take over here. Let's see about this thing. Hey, we're going to take a break in just a moment. I want you to turn your attention to the screen for a few announcements and then we'll give you a little restroom break before we come back in. Hey everyone, here's what's happening at Centerville Community. Coming up on Saturday, March 25th, we are having a men's missions breakfast at Scrambler's Restaurant from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. to hear from the CMA Regional Director in Europe, Ed Mangum. If you're interested in being a part of this event, you can find it on the events page of our website, as well as the registration link. You need to register by March 19th at the latest, so be sure and register as soon as possible. The registration link will also be available on the iPads out in the lobby after service today. VBS is coming up the week of June 5th through the 9th, and we are looking for some VBS volunteers. There's something for everyone. We're looking for teachers, teacher helpers, people to help in the nursery, teen helpers, parking lot, providing teachers with snacks, you name it, we need it. You can sign up on the event page to be a volunteer for VBS this year, or you can see Sandy and Donna at the table out in the atrium after service today. Coming up on March 29th, Jews for Jesus is putting on a Seder-type presentation here at the church in the atrium from 6.30 p.m. to 7.45 p.m. In this format, everyone sits around tables and participates in the ceremony, tasting the traditional Passover elements. 
This is not a filling meal, so we suggest that you have your dinner before you come. There's limited space for this event, so please sign up as soon as possible. You can find the event on the events page of our website. Once the spaces are all filled up, we cannot accept any more signups for the event. At the end of our time together today, you'll have an opportunity to give. Here at Centerville Community, we view giving as an act of worship, not an obligation or something that we have to do, but something that we get to do to show that we believe that the Lord will always take care of us and give us everything that we need. So out of the abundance that the Lord has given us, we give sacrificially and full of faith to believe that that money will go toward accomplishing the mission of Jesus here in Ohio and around the world. So if you believe that the Lord is leading you to give, you can drop either cash or a check in one of the giving boxes that we've placed at each exit of the room on your way out of service today. You can also check out our other ways to give, either online or over text. If you are a first-time guest with us, in person or online, or have been visiting for a few weeks, we would love for you to fill out a Connect card. Connect cards are how we help you get connected here at Centerville Community. Whether you're just checking us out, looking to join a group, or would like to know more about taking next steps in a relationship with Jesus, we would love to be there for you along that journey and help Centerville Community feel more like home. You can find a Connect card either on the Centerville Community Church app or our website. And if you're here in the building with us today, you can find a Connect card in the seat back in front of you. Once you've filled it out, just drop your Connect card in one of the giving boxes that we've placed at each of the exits to the room. Thank you so much for being with us today. And that's what's happening at Centerville Community. Awesome. Hey, one quick change we had for even from last week. Anson and Peter are still gone. They're in, uh, coming back this week from New Zealand. So one of the announcements is untrue. The men's breakfast is not happening on the 26th. We just couldn't fix the video because none of us know how. Um, and it's going to actually be at the end of April. And uh, we'll let you know more about that. So don't sign up for the men's breakfast on the 26th because there won't be anybody there. All right. It'll be the 30th of April. The books will be out on the table if you want to stop by at his book table. We're going to start the next session at 1110. So you have about 13 minutes. If you want to run to the restroom, go by his table. Um, and then if you have questions, I would write them down. And we may not have time for all of them, um, but he'll be hanging out at his table uh, after the second session, and you can meet Dr. Slee. So take off for a few minutes, and we'll start right at 1110. All right?
fantastic. And we're going to welcome back to the stage Dr. Matthew Sleece, Dr. John Matthew Sleece. See, I was listening. Dr. John Matthew Sleece. Well, good morning. All right, uh, just so it helps me, raise your hand if you were not here in the last service. Most of you were here. And those of you who are not, it's gonna go on your permanent record. <laughs> in the last service, uh, I discussed suicide, the incidence of it, it's bad, it's getting worse. Uh, a little bit about the worldviews I come from, which are both a uh, Christian physician who believes in Hippocratic medicine, which means you don't kill people. And, and we talked, uh, we began to do questions and answers uh, about specifics. And I was handed a question and I, I started talking about uh, not suicide or anxiety or that type of thing, uh, as a pathology, but talking about what are some of the answers to this that are unique to the church. Uh, and of course, the main answer that's unique to the church is that we're the church that believes in Christ. Christ is the head of our church. And so I was asked a number of questions about that, just how strong is Jesus' redemption on the cross and that sort of thing. So. I wanna talk about some of the things that from personal and family experience, I have found that give rest for the soul, if, if you will, and I'm gonna lean into that for a moment. Uh, and I'll leave plenty of time for questions and answers. And I wanna present, uh, I'm gonna be talking about Sabbath, and it's something I've taught a lot about, and it's something I've lived because when I became a Christian 20 years ago, the first spiritual discipline, if you will, was to start keeping the Sabbath. And I'll, let me turn back to Isaiah here for a second. Boy, I hope I can find this on the fly. Uh, can I paraphrase if I can't find it? Um, no? Ooh. Uh, gonna have to paraphrase. Um, in Isaiah it says, in returning in rest, you will find your strength. And the world tells you that you'll find your strength in power, in prestige, in money, in looks, in being the winning team, et cetera, et cetera. And scripture says that in stopping and rest, you'll find strength. So the Bible's answer to where strength comes from and rest for your soul is very, very different than the world's. Um, let me give you my bottom, bottom line on my theology of Sabbath since there's been a lot of argument over this over the last 2,000 years. I do not believe that Sabbath keeping is a condition of getting into heaven. I just believe it's the condition that heaven is in if you get there. Uh, so you, you could never keep Sabbath in your life. I think that um, that, that is not gonna be asked uh, of you. Uh, however, w w we live on, this side of the cross, we, we, Jesus has already died for us. We don't have to do any particular thing to get in heaven. We can't earn our salvation. But I, for one, want a glimpse of heaven even before I get there. And I have found that one of the ways of getting in the side door of the Garden of Eden, the front door is blocked, is Sabbath. And every generation, of, I'm just gonna answer all the theologic questions before they come up. Every generation of the church since Christ has wrestled with whether or not we need to keep the Sabbath, even though it's an Old Testament commandment, if you will. 
It's a unique commandment. It's the only one that begins with the word remember. (laughs) And every generation of the church has said, yes, we should do it. When the you know, Coptic and Roman and Eastern Orthodox and all, all, all these churches split. Everyone wrestled with this. When the Reformation came along, they wrestled with it. Um, should we keep the Sabbath? And virtually every single expression of Christianity for the last 2,000 years has said yes. You and I live in the first generation where it's not only become optional, people have forgotten the Sabbath. And scripture says, some people think one day is sacred, some think another, and it says, per se, it doesn't matter, but you should have a conviction. And uh, many, many Christians today do not have a conviction one way or another. And so I'm convicted that the Sabbath is good for you. I know physically it's good for you. Um, If you uh, keep Sabbath, you live longer. There's a book called The Blue Zone, and they look at where people around the planet live longest, and they try to look for common elements in that, and there's all the kind of secular things. They're connected to community. They have a support network. They're valued as they age. Those are all wonderful things, but uh, a common element is one day a week given to rest. And uh, and, and so I think it's, it's physically good for you, and uh, the, the, the ministry that I work for actually did a five-year study on 2,000 pastors in North Carolina. Uh, and that's expensive to do. <laughs> and it's good for you if you keep the Sabbath. It's no other way to put it. Physically. But we don't do things just for physically. So where does Sabbath come from? Uh, if you open up the Bible, God uh, speaks the world into existence. And uh, I believe that the opening of the Bible is a song, actually. And, and so I think the world, world is spoken into existence and, and the angels are singing as this happened. And we have the record of that. And on the seventh day, it says that God finished his work. Well, what did he finish on the seventh day? He did something on the seventh day. And what he did was to make the Sabbath. Um, and... And it says, uh, and on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. That is the first time that the word rest shows up in scripture, and it's kadosh, and it's also holy. Rest is holy, God rests, God is holy, therefore rest. It's called the transitive property in math. We got any math teachers in here? I was gonna say we could trash math, but we can't do it, we got math teachers in here. You give us more anxiety dreams than every other teacher put together. (laughs) Do we have any English teachers in the room? Okay, we can make fun of syllogism, same thing. But, uh, and so, uh, so God rests, God is holy, therefore rest is holy. And one of the next times that the word holy shows up in Scripture is on Aaron's um, uh, hat uh, as, as the chief priest, and it says, holy unto the Lord which could just as easily be translated set aside to the Lord or rest with the Lord. If you're following the math here, this is where people start having those bad dreams. Did anybody have one of those? You're handed a book like this, the exam is the next day and you've never seen it? It's just me, okay. Uh, And so rest is this incredibly holy thing. And then when God takes the least rested people on the planet who have been slaves for 400 years and he brings them out of that slavery and they come out with bling on and before he teaches them thou shalt not kill or don't covet or any of that, he teaches them about rest and Sabbath. And one of the first things he teaches them is you gotta get your work done beforehand 
Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall do, not do any work. You or your maidservant, your manservant, your kids. Boy, I wish I had a couple of maid and manservants. Your kids, the foreigners who are with you, even your cattle have to come to a stop. And one of the reasons that the church has always gone with Sabbath, even though it's an Old Testament law, if you will, is because the people who are the weakest in society benefit by it, by not being made to work seven days a week. And so the, the church has come down on the side of it. And God, God takes these people out and, and he gives them rest. And he, he gives them manna, the food just falls out of the sky. Um, and only one day a week are they allowed to pick up twice as much and prepare for that next day when, um, when, when they are set aside to rest. And when I became a Christian, there was a period of a couple of years between when I became a Christian in my family and then my children and my wife were all on the same page. But my family started observing the Sabbath with me, even though they weren't all on the same page religiously or, or in their faith. And it was familiar territory for my wife because uh, she grew up as a Jew. And I've been to more Passover seders. All you guys are serving are just like the harosa and the lamb shank. And it's a mini. Yeah, definitely eat up <laughs> before, before you come for that. Um, and, and so God taught these people to rest. Now, I'm going to teach you something I was talking about last night with some, some guys I was having uh, dinner with here. And I'm going to teach you something about the Old Testament, which might be a little different take on it, but it's one of those, it'll ring true to you once I, once I tell you. And I got to go out to the farm in order to teach this. I grew up in um, Maryland, and it was all dairy farms around where I grew up. And, um, and, and one thing that happens is when you plant a field, and it's particularly noticeable with corn. I remember this. There'll always be a section that comes up faster than another. Do we have anybody who farms in here? Yeah, this is true. You see this. Uh, so, and I'm not counting just where it's wetter in a field or something like that. And, and over time, and this is before you could, you know, go down to the store and order seed corn, uh, that sort of thing, over time... Uh, you, you, you'd grab that section that comes up first, and that would be your seed corn. And the reason is that that grain that's coming up first tends to finish first, and it tends to be the most disease and drought resistant, and you always want a crop that comes up and finishes faster <laughs> if, you're, if you're a farmer. And so uh, every, every year, over decades, centuries, we're selecting for the hardiest uh, plant that we can get. Everybody with me now? It's going to be on the final exam. And especially on yours, you got to show your work, okay? Um, and the same thing is true in animal husbandry. Uh, if I have a calf that's born and it puts on weight faster, that means somehow it's a little bit more efficient in turning that feed into fat and at the end of a year, if that, um, th that animal is, is a little fatter and better off than all the rest, I don't kill and eat that animal. I don't geld it if, it, if it's, it, it's a bull. That becomes my breeding bull. Everybody still following me? They have different names in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, the seed corn is called your first fruits. And this breeding bull, a year old, is called the fatted calf. And what the Hebrew people were instructed to do by God was what we would really call agricultural suicide. There's <laughs> no other way to do it. If, you, if every, every year you take out the best and, 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 and you eat the, the fatted calf, you're going to be selecting over time for a worse and worse crop or livestock. I live in Lexington, Kentucky. They raise horses there. And the last thing they're going to do is eat 
the, the filly that can run at the end of a year faster than anything else. And, and, but what God is trying to teach them is two things. One, I am responsible for your prosperity. And two, trust. Because this takes trust to do. And all the other cultures around them would have thought they were nuts. And then they would have thought they were insane every seventh year. They just stopped everything. And I think that most of us today are so clever and so scientific that we ultimately end up not trusting the Lord because we've never, we've never had a real concrete example of following the Lord. And, and, and one of the areas that this works out actually the most in people's lives is if they have financial problems. You wanna get out of debt? Start tithing. It readjusts all of your thinking. You give your first fruit and it begins to organize your life. And I used to know the exact number, but it's, as I recall, it's almost a third of Nobel Prize winners are Sabbath keepers. You see, you don't come up with a theory of relativity while you're working away at the university teaching and publishing. You come up with the theory of relativity while you're daydreaming at your patent office desk because you don't have enough work. Um, rest leads actually to more thought, more creativity, more production, if you will. Um, and the world is over here in this bricks, bricks, more bricks and no straw. And God is over here saying, my rest is more powerful than human work. And, uh, and so everything about Sabbath is counterintuitive. Uh, and yet I can tell you that it works. And now I get to, will you forgive me for bragging for a second? Yes. He said, I'm holy, or yeah, holy. fully, I'm fully forgiven. Whew. Um, my family came into this as my kids were teenagers, and they were at uh, a school, St. Johnsbury Academy in St. Johnsbury, Vermont, that's really a tough high school. And it doesn't have like a high school building, it has an arts building and a science building and a gymnasium and et cetera, et cetera. And it's, uh, it's been in existence for quite some time and it's graduated one president and 50 congressmen and senators. So it, it's a tough school. And academically, um, there tw when my wife was teaching there, there were over a dozen embedded bodyguards. So people are sending kids from all over the world we got our kids in free because local schools are allowed the tuition in their kids. Are, where we were living at the time was too small to have its own high school. So our kids were able to go there. And my wife was teaching there, and my kids are there. And teachers came to my wife and said, your kids said they don't do homework on Sunday. They are not going to succeed. Because the world, whether you're in a Christian school or a secular school, does everything exactly the same. It's all about working seven days a week. <laughs> and so <clears throat> my kids said, we're going to try this experiment. We're going we're to give the biggest chunk of study one day out of the week, Sunday, over holy to God. And here's how the experiment turned out. This is where you have to forgive me. My son was valedictorian of that school. My daughter did not graduate. She wanted so desperately to go rejoin her brother that she begged the Asbury College if they would take an application early. She was told, well, if you do really great on your SATs, we'll consider it. She missed two questions. She disputes one. <laughs> she was accepted as a 15-year-old. This story is just a broken record after this. They both graduate first in their class. My son goes to University of Kentucky Med School. It's the only school he applied to. Where do you think he graduated in his class? One, youngest student there ever. Does the same thing in residency. They're smart kids. They got a Jewish mom. <laughs> 10,000 other kids in the United States got the same thing, probably 100,000. They're special sauce was that every single week they had one day 
that they knew they were loved for being human beings, not human doings. That's the special sauce. And I personally, my head would explode if I didn't know that tomorrow is my Sabbath. By the way, I think God wants us to park Sabbath on Sunday, the Lord's Day. But if you park it somewhere else, that's fine. You don't have to keep it at all. Um, but I think that God also builds community with Sabbath. A, a group that works together is great, but a group that rests together is holy. And so um, in Scripture, we have five places that you can go to in the New Testament where the Lord's Day can either be explicitly acknowledged or implicitly acknowledged. And so I think that God doesn't want us just all out doing our own thing resting. I think ideally what we do is we build community and, and, and we know that we're resting together and we're resting in the Lord. We're trusting that even if we put our seed grain in the offering plate that we're going to prosper. And it's not a prosperity gospel. It's just an understanding that all of our well-being comes from the Lord and not from our own cleverness. So uh, that's a little bit about Sabbath. Have, oh, I'm almost at Q&A time. I am, aren't I? Have you thought of a question yet? No, not a great question. <sighs> You're forgiven. <laughs> okay. By the way, that reminds me. I'm, I'm not in a Catholic church, <laughs> but if you grew up in a Catholic church or a Lutheran church, you number the commandments differently. And uh, I, I'm just going to, one last thing, and then everybody think of your questions. The Ten Commandments uh, were renumbered by the Catholic church, and the Lutheran church went along with that. But I go with the numbering that the Jews had because they owned the real estate first. And I want to point out one thing about the Ten Commandments. Commandments one through three I'm the Lord your God, I made you, you can't make me, idols are out. Um, it, it's a sin to call on my name in, in vanity. Um, those three commandments are about God. Commandments five through 10, I'll put them on this side of the room, are about humanity. Um, honor your parents, don't kill, lie, cheat, steal, run around or put stuff on your credit card to keep up with your neighbors. I'm paraphrasing. Thou shall not put stuff on your credit card. So <laughs> commandments 5 through 10 aren't about God. They're about humanity. Commandments 1 through 3 are about eternity. They're always going to exist. Commandments 5 through 10 are about <laughs> temporal things. They're about earth, heaven, earth, God, humanity. The fourth commandment, the longest commandment in Scripture, the only commandment that God applies explicitly to God, to which group does it belong? I believe both. I believe that one of the things that Sabbath does is to make a bridge between heaven and earth, between the eternal and the temporal, between God and man. And when I walk out on that bridge, God never stands me up. We stand God up if we don't get there. And if I, and I've done this a zillion times, I've got to truncate this, but I've asked people to buddy up and talk about their memories of Sunday when they were growing up and there's always a premium on people with gray hair or no hair uh, because they have better memories of that. Um, what people say is, well, we went to church and we had big meals at home, and how many of you were made to take a nap? Raise your hand. Yeah, a bunch of you. And we didn't go shopping that day, and my parents were, were home and everything. And those are all beautiful things. And they all follow the Ten Commandments. We went to church. The, the Lord was God. We put the idols aside. The opposite of taking the Lord's name in vain is to worship. We honored our parents. We gathered around the table, sometimes grandparents and everything. Thou shall not kill, physically impossible to do while you're taking a nap. <laughs> Thou shall not commit adultery. I got to say this in code. There are those of you who took naps when you were a kid and you got up early from your nap and you went to your parents' door and it was locked. Your parents were not committing adultery, okay? <laughs> The Lord knew that we needed all these things to restore our souls. 
and he gave us a space and a place to do it in. And who's against all those things? Who does not want you in church? Who does not want your family whole? Who does not want the door locked? Satan. And so, and if you think about this from a strategic, we're in the middle of a war. I said that last, uh, last service or whatever you call this. And, and Satan is strategic. And if you, if you invade a country, you never have enough bombs to blow everything up. You bomb the bridge first. You bomb the connection. And, and I believe that unless the church recaptures Sabbath, it's going to be very difficult. I'm not saying this is a salvation thing. I'm just saying it's for the health of the church. It's the real estate and time that God deeded to the church to live on. And all we have to do is re-up the lease every seven days, and we've walked away from it. And so many, many of the questions about young people and suicide and anxiety and uh, cannot be answered simply. They can be answered by Sabbath, for one. It's not a cure-all, it's not a panacea, um, and yet it makes all those things that God smiles at easier. Now, I better do Q&A. Okay, yes. Yeah, we're, we're not told to be the judges of the world. And it's very difficult uh, for me as a Christian to not want to be the judge, the jury, the prosecutor. We're just told to be the witness. And I think by not keeping Sabbath, we're not being a good witness as to what we believe in. I think by not giving our first fruits um, to the church, whether that's corn or dollars or whatever, or our time, We're not being good witnesses. So there isn't an easy fix it bang like that. Um, But I've, uh, and and I will tell you as a pastor, and I don't know if you've had to do this, Kendrick, the utterly most difficult uh, sermon to give is at the funeral of someone who's committed suicide who was not a believer. There's no question they're not a believer. What do you say? And I got asked to do that Fortunately, only once, and I've been asked to come and preach uh, at a sermon of a five-year-old who's nobody in the family believes. That's easy. Kingdom of heaven is made of children. <laughs> I'll argue that. My, that's why, you know, my family's in the baby-saving business. I'll argue that all day long. But what about an adult? Um, and and I've, I've struggled with that for years. What should I have said? Because they didn't say anything. And you can't rush out and give the gospel to, you know, that, that setting or whatever. And I, I've come to this. If I was ever asked that again, um, it, what I do uh, is to say, what, 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 the, what would the Bible have me do? And what the, that's one of the most difficult questions you just asked. Thank you. You get the award. Take the trophy back to her. You're no longer allowed to have it, okay? Um, uh, is that the safest thing in that position is to plead with God for mercy. You watch Abraham get up in the face of God when he's pleading for the soul of the wickedest place that will ever exist. The place that Jesus says, it's even worse for you than Sodom. And, and look at his math as he backs down. <laughs> The number, oh, how about this many? How many? And he just skips over a set or whatever. Um, and, and, the, and the Lord loves Abraham. Um, his faith is counted to him as righteousness and his faith in pleading for the, for the lost. And so if I ever had to do that, I would simply have a 30-minute prayer for the mercy of God in this and leave it in God's hands. It's not in ours. Um, it's a great question there's not simple answers to great things other than bottom, bottom line is Christ. Yes? I have a brother who committed suicide. One of the things that I've struggled with is what could I have done that maybe would have prevented that? So as a practical matter, looking at it today is how do I know that there's somebody out there that I could talk to and maybe talk them out of it? 
Yeah. And uh, uh, can I restate that so I make sure I, you lost a brother to suicide. You want to know now how you can reassure yourself or that you are in the Lord's will doing what he wants you to do if somebody else is in the same situation. Is that okay? Uh, I, I speak from Bible and experience, and I don't, I try not to tell second, third hand stories. Uh, my brother in law um, uh, called me on February 10th, I think it was, two years ago, and he had been struggling with alcohol and depression for years and years. He was a brilliant attorney. He argued his first case in front of the Supreme Court before he was 30 years old. He was disbarred by the time he was 35 or so, and just alcohol, alcohol, alcohol after that, etc. And he called me up, and I had gone and pleaded with him in hospitals, in rehab, and offered the gospel, and always made myself available. And he called me up, and he was like, oh, you're right. I finally got it. I just don't have the energy. And the next day, he ended his life. And I would feel very, very badly if I hadn't tried everything I knew to do. Ultimately, we cannot, we cannot make somebody accept life. <laughs> they have to choose life. And, and so we want to, I think the best thing if you've lost somebody like that is to go out and work with others and tell them, first of all, some of the pain that you, you felt, which, by the way, stops people from killing themselves. Christians are four times less likely to take their own life than a non-Christian. Doesn't mean they don't do it, but they're four times less likely. And when I wrote Hope Always, I wanted to know why do Christians live, even though we think about suicide at the same, as the same rate as non-Christians. Um, and by the way, this relationship has been uh, known since Durkheim discovered in uh, 150 years ago and scientifically kind of uh, put it out there. He's a French psychologist. But, um, and, and so <clears throat> Christians are less likely. And I said, why are Christians less likely? And the number one reason is they were afraid of what's going to happen when they die. What's the beginning of wisdom? Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So if they come into a church that says, everything's groovy no matter what you do, are you helping them? No. Fear, not trying to put the fear of God in them, but saying, man, I, I do sometimes what I don't want to do because I'm afraid that God is not going to be happy with me if I don't. And I'll just share this with you. I mean, when I became a Christian, my wife and I were in a very, very dark place. All I wanted was a different wife. And I remember reading for the first time, it was on the right-hand side of the page of the Bible I had, you will make your wife an adulteress. You are not allowed to divorce your wife. And doing that, even though I didn't want to, even though friends said, because she'd gotten depressed after her brother drowned and she didn't get treated that's not fun to live with and but the bible says you're you're together with her forever 20 years later guess what the lord gave me a new wife and she is smoking hot <laughs> okay <laughs> but guess what she got a new husband too <laughs> And he's a way better, you know, guy to be around, I think, than the old guy, although he needs a lot of work still. So, um, and so find those young people. Go down to the high school, the junior high school. High school students will, I, I, I went to a public high school in, in the Lexington area. I, I was asked by a student, 16 years old, Fellowship of Christian Athletes asked me, and he said, can you bring about 20 books? That's what we have there. I took a photo. I don't have my phone with me of the 100 kids standing in the room before, cl before classes listening. And, and they would have stayed there all day long. If you go down and speak love and truth, they're with you. They won't leave. And so I really urge you that, and you have the experience of the pain of losing a brother to get involved in that. Those of you who have gone through this tough thing have something beautiful to share and that's the wisdom of how much families hurt so the number one is 
a reason that Christians don't commit suicide is fear of the Lord. And the number two is an understanding of how much pain it will cause their family. And we can't just cover those things up because they help. They keep people alive. So great questions. This is a smarter group than the last one. Yeah, the last group was great, but this is the gifted and talent class. Go ahead. question is, we, we know the rituals and routines they went through in the Old Testament when they had Sabbath. We know that by the time Jesus came along, um, they'd added all kinds of rules that aren't even in the Bible. There's a sect in, in, uh, in Israel at that time that believed that one could not have a bow movement on the Sabbath. And we found out a lot about this when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. I'm thinking that's why they call it restroom, really. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> and I think one of the things to answer your question is first to understand what happens on the Sabbath. Now, Jesus um, does more of his miracles on the Sabbath than any other day. And spread over four Gospels, and not all of them in any one, he does seven miracles. This is not an accident. And all of them have one thing in common. He doesn't walk on water that day. Uh, he's not feeding 5,000. He heals on the Sabbath. That is the business of Jesus. As the Lord of the Sabbath, he heals on that day. And so um, I think in order to give Jesus the space to heal on that day, you've got to separate the world out. And I think if I had one, I'd pull it out a phone. I think the phones have got to stay off and the computers have got to stay shut on that day. You don't have to do that. You don't have to take Sabbath at all. But I think it's difficult for people to realize how much they're being influenced by the world when their pocket's buzzing every 15 or 20 minutes. Um, and so for us, it's a screenless day. Um, and I think, I think that one of the really important things about Sabbath is preparing for it. And... Um, and, and that's taught in scripture, and that's the reason for my kids doing so well in school is because all their homework was done Saturday night. And there's a kind of, ah, when you get your work done. And so working uh, is important um, on those six days, and, and rest is here, but you gotta get your work done. Busy is not work. What do you, what's the battle cry of the 21st century? I'm so busy. <laughs> There's only one person in scripture who introduces themselves to God as busy. It's in the book of Job. He's late for the meeting. <laughs> Where have you been, Satan? I've been going to and fro, up and down. Poetry of Job for I'm busy. And so you gotta sit busyness aside. And in order that, to do that, you have to get your work done. Um, please take a book, okay? <laughs> Cause it, it, that I've got out there, because it's all about this. By the way, that book you couldn't almost give away when I started. Now there's another book even by the same name, 24-6, a fraction, bizarre. Um, but, uh, it, and, and it's become the best-selling book on Sabbath or the last decade, which is like me standing up here and bragging about the, being the tallest of the seven dwarfs. But particularly on Gen Z, they want to listen. They have been scheduled up. They've been buckled in, in you know, little space uh, seats in the back of cars and taken to pre, pre, preschool from the second they were born. And Jesus always meets people where they are to begin with. And he tends to cure your blindness, heal your heal your leprosy, et cetera, before he begins to give you the gospel. And it's very interesting to me that in the revival that's happened, the number one thing I hear by young people is we walked in that building and time stopped. Over and over and over again, they said, I thought I was there for 15 minutes and it was four hours later. And there were professors that said, no, your homework is due no matter what. We don't care if Jesus is over in Hughes Auditorium. I'm more important, get your homework in. 
And one of the most beautiful stories I heard on our Friday night dinners, two girls came over, been on the list since November to come to our house. We don't know them. Turns out beautifully they are um, uh, Asbury uh, students. And one of them tells the story of a professor saying, I just think kids are trying to get out of class. I mean, there's literally Jesus over in there healing people like out of the, out of the Bible. Um, and she said, so I took my homework in and I sat up there and I, and I got my jeans on and everything and I just did my homework and I've never gotten it done so fast. Um, this Gen Z needs rest more than any generation because they've been clocked from the second they were born. They've got APGAR scores. Everything is about numbers and scores and, and how many likes you got, et cetera, et cetera. And Sabbath is when all that just gets set aside. Um, and it's, it's us, up to us to give them the space for it. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. You've you've said a lot there. Let me. Um, you, you've described a sister who's tried to commit suicide. She is confused about who she's attracted to. She's she's gay. I I don't like that word because I don't think these people are gay. They're trying to commit suicide at a rate no one has ever um, uh, been. By the way, that's Isaiah. We're called black, white, <laughs> up, down. Um, not, no language will be, be accurate or whatever. Um, and l let me, uh, you can sit down, I'll answer this. <laughs> and l let, me just, let me just talk about by the way, church is where we grapple with the hard stuff. You think kids can do this in front of their sociology teacher in a public high school? This is the place for it to happen. I'm going to give you an even harder question. Uh, let, me, let me flip to the, the answer in the Bible before I even get going here. Uh, I love the book of Isaiah. Um, oh, I just, I'm sorry, I just come across this. We, we need to teach young people how to, how to interpret Bible in 21st century. There is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. I will not trash a living person from a pulpit, but you're dead, fair game. Who was the, who was the king of pop? Michael Jackson. He needed general anesthesia to take a nap. Propofol is the most powerful anesthetic I've ever given anybody. No rest for the wicked, gee. It's right there in the Bible. Um, and so, uh, here's a scenario. <clears throat> I have a pastor come to visit me. This is a brilliant pastor. Um, a, a PhD level pastor. Uh, and he and he, he and I are walking in Lexington, and he says, <clears throat> Matthew, I got a question I got to ask you. Uh, he says that <clears throat> I met, I, I had this person who came to my church, and I'm completely stumped by their question. Here's the background: this guy has a, a wife, I think three children, a, a wonderful, thriving business. His kids are getting out of high school, and at the dinner table, he says. I've decided I'm going to be a woman. The horror for the family, I can't fathom or whatever. And he walks away from that and, and ruins his family. His business is eventually ruined. He has surgery. He transitions and everything, then has multiple failed relationships. And the Lord gets a hold of him. And he gets saved. And he comes in with lipstick on and all this sort of thing, and he says to the pastor, what do I do now? You think that's an easy question to, to answer? Anybody want to attack? Come on up. I'll give you the, you got the microphone? Yeah. What do I do? And then he said, what class was that in seminary? I 
Isaiah 56, 3. Let not the foreigner, and you can't get any more foreign than that, who has joined himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely save from his people. And let not the eunuch say, behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbath, who choose the things that please me and hold fast my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Do you think that's a better place to begin the discussion than I don't know? We didn't have that in class. And so on all these things, I think we need to rediscover the Bible. <laughs> we need to speak it in 21st century. When I talk to young people and I get some of the angst of their lives, and one of the stories I'll tell is about Solomon trying to find out who the real mom is. You guys remember the story. And, and the solution is we're going to cut the baby in half, which, of course, he's not going to do. And he finds out who the real mom is. Do you know what cutting the baby in half is called in 21st century? Shared custody. These kids are living in Bible situations. That guy is coming up with a Bible situation, and we're not going to the Bible to find the answers. And so I plead with you to rediscover Scripture, to ask it tough questions. Um, uh, it, it has the answers, and there isn't an easy answer to give you, but you've got to go in love, and you've got to speak truth, and you might as well have the Bible do it for you. Um, is my answer to that. How many more questions? Oh, one last question. Do I have time for one last one? Yes. Okay. The question, and I'm talking about hope. Have I found any programs that are working? Raise your hand if you have had a family member or uh, a close friend take their own lives by suicide. Okay, I'm guessing that's 10% or less here. When I go to a mega church, it's over half. It's just reality. I was in a church uh, a week ago that frankly is one of the best churches I've ever been in in my life. They, uh, they asked me to go on a retreat with them. And it was just lovely. They didn't ask me what to preach on. They said, you got five one-hour sections if you want them. Preach on anything you want. When I asked them that question, I think like two hands went up. They loved each other better than any church I've ever seen. They delighted in each other's company. They never said something. It was just all encouragement, encouragement, encouragement. And I was with, with them for three days until the last day. I didn't figure out who the pastor was in the room. I'm giving you a hard time, but I would have a hard time figuring you too um, because the pastor was so modest. Um, I don't think, I think the only answer to this is, is love. The hope lies in love. My whiz-bang knowledge of the Bible will be gone. Speaking in tongues will be gone. Prophecy will be gone. Love is the only thing that lasts, and only Scripture tells you how to do it. And I, I would like to end in prayer, and I'm not going to do the praying. And I would invite those of you who have family members who have taken their own lives or are wrestling with that, or you're wrestling it with yourself, to just come up here. I can't answer these questions ultimately. Uh, only Christ can. And, and I'll, I'll, just, I'll just leave it there. And the rest of you, you know, pray how, how you, you see fit. Is that okay? Thanks. I'm going to close in prayer. And uh, if you need to stay after for some prayer today, we would we'd love to do that. And I'll be up here uh, ready to do that. And if you need to 
to give us a call because you want to stop by and you want to talk. We are open to do that as well. But uh, would you bow your heads in prayer? And uh, as we leave, let's leave reverently today. And Dr. Sleeth will be out at his table if you'd like to talk with him and, and ask any more personal questions. But let's leave this house uh, to be a house of prayer um, in these closing moments at this, at this noon hour. Father, we are in all. We're in all of your spirit at work in this room. We're in all of who you are and what you have done in our lives. And today has been a day where we've talked about topics that usually are silenced in the church. Uh, usually are topics we don't bring up or we just hope we'll go somewhere else and have that conversation. And as Dr. Sleeth shared, I, I affirm his words that if there's any place these conversations should take place, it's the local church. So God, in this room, for those that are hurting today, I pray that you would be close. I pray that they would know that you're a God that wants to extend to them and pass on to them a peace that doesn't make sense, that passes all understanding. You're a God that wants to mend. You're a God that wants to restore. You're a God that wants to make all things new in our lives. And so, God, for those in this room that are experiencing pain, that are experiencing hardship, may they know right now at this moment the all-encompassing agape love of Jesus, a love that is abiding, a love that is lavished upon us. God, we thank you for the cross, for we have hope because of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. We have power because of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. We have, as we've been studying in Mark, we have authority through the Holy Spirit that it's indwelling in us because of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. God, I pray that you would open up doors, open up doors for hope and open up doors for healing, open up doors and opportunities for we as the church, whether it's through our new pastoral care counseling that we're going to launch later this spring or just at our own workplaces or just in our own relationships at the ball field or the grocery store, that there would be open doors for people to share and to be heard and to know the ultimate hope of Jesus Christ. God, we love you. And we pray that you would bless Dr. Sleeth and his ministry greatly and his wife Nancy and their kids as he travels this country and shares the hope that is found in Jesus Christ. God, we love you today, and we pray this all in Jesus' precious holy name. Amen. Amen. Church, if you want to, um, we'll see you next Sunday as we work back in Mark 6, but let's leave quietly and leave this place a, a house of prayer, and Dr. Sleeth will meet you out in the Atrian, if you wish. God bless, and thanks for being with us today.